The lights change. Now we go racing at Donington. And it's a good getaway by Rob Collard. Kevin Say on the outside line. Giacomo Petrobelli in 87. He's on his toes in the acid on the inside. John Ferguson gets into Kevin Say. There's contact and off the road goes Kevin Say. Off the road also goes Mark Smith. I fear that is in the McLaren. And have they all managed to scrabble through? And can Kevin Say dig himself out of the gravel? That is far from the ideal start. It was a little bit of contact, I fear, between the BMW of John Ferguson, the Mercedes AMG of Kevin Say, and that car is still beached on the outside of Redgate. Yeah, the slightest of touches as we see another touch between the 90 Optima car and the Facetti 47. That was an interesting one to call. The inside was covered by the 90 car, but was he alongside enough to make it fair? Is that Aston Martin full of grass? I can see the marshals out the window running to Kevin Say's aid. Can they push him out? So hard to push these GT cars out of a gravel trap. The marshals try their best. They've got about 55 seconds until the cars are there. Peter Daly will be deciding, does this need to be a full course yellow or a safety car? Was it the slightest touch of Ferguson? Was it cold tyres for Kevin Say? I have to admit, I missed that part of it. I need a replay to see, but the cars are so low to that point, it would only take a little breath from Ferguson's front bumper to send Kevin Say off into the scenery. John Ferguson slowing to the inside. Can't see any visible damage, but why was that? I can't see any reason. No yellow flag, so no. that must be a problem with that car. OK, so is that a legacy of the contact? Is it something else? We'll try to find out. Kevin Say comes then now down towards the S's. So John Ferguson in strife as well. Yeah, that car clearly has a big, big problem because it's crawling its way down Starkey Straight tumbling down the order as the leaders then come down now towards the Melbourne hairpin. It doesn't look like it's a puncture, but he's not going to get to the pit lane, is he? That BMW looks as though its race is run. There's still a lot going on. Richard Neary really is a man on the move. Every time we see him, he seems to have overtaken the car. Ratcliffe to the inside of Topham. Oh, Real contact. Lazy. That turns Topham around and into the back of it goes Carl Cavers. They're all going to sort themselves out, but Mark Radcliffe is the one that's lost out there because they've all gone streaming past him and the McLaren is sort of coasting as he's trying to get the car fired up again. So Richard Neary now is up into sixth place. You've got Ian Loggy now up into eighth, and Matt Topham is about to lose more ground. Sasha Kakad on the inside line in the Audi. Into Hollywood they go, but no, Topham around the outside hangs onto the place, and that was all a little bit scrappy at Goddard's, wasn't it? Yeah, just awkward, and we go on board with Loggy, you're going to get a view of them coming to a slow cavers into the back of Reckley because he had nowhere to go. Loggy reads it well, doesn't yeah. he? Three places for the price of one there. I was a little critical of Sean Bell backing out with the first move into the Melbourne hairpin. Mark Radcliffe tried to back out, but too late, and just wanted to become invisible, which is quite hard to do in a modern GT3 car, and he was definitely at fault. Topham could have given him more space, but I don't think needed to. And this looks like a long stop. And, and for what looked like a relatively light tap, you can see the damage that's been done to the front of that car. Yeah, and I think I just heard one of the mechanics shout rat. I think that's done as we see Neary gets the move done on Price and Balfour's gone as well. So yeah. that's been a really interesting first sector. Doesn't look like there's any GT4 traffic. Let's see what's happened. They're both fighting to try and overtake <laughs> each other around McLean's and Sean Balfe goes, Oh, shut up, Joe. Why are you telling me to be more aggressive? I'll just overtake him when they're not looking. Andrew Howard in the beach, Dean Astin. Been missing for a couple of rounds with work commitments. Good to have him back in, former champion. We know how fast he can be. Price running wide. Loggy gets it done. Engine in the wrong place. But he can get the drive out the corner done. Final track limit warning in this in the background. Ravi Ramy is being warned about uh, track limit defences. You see, Sasha Kaka dive up the inside. Oh, so nearly wipe out Ian Loggy. He's run deep out of the corner. That gives Mike Price the place back. And then Carl Cavers in 22 BMW comes up on the outside line as well. Save it up as we see Price on the grass this time. Just maybe, is that a cold tyre that Greystone have had to put on for that puncher that's caught him out? Some straight wheel spin, that's exactly where he went off in warm-up. Indeed so, coming through Schwantz Curve. And it's not quite a carbon copy because the moment started earlier, like it was wrong coming out of the old hairpin, put him across the road and he's on the grass and a big, big spin coming through Schwantz Curve. That could have been a whole lot worse. GT3 Aston looming behind as well of Petrobelli. So that is a chance that maybe Meekin can use that as the openers, we see a front left puncher for Martin. Won't be one of their mandatory pit stops either. No. This is going to lose them 45 to 50 seconds. This is going to really spice up the race and the championship. Absolutely crucial moment, this. Alex Martin down the pit lane. He'll have been on the radio. Barwell will be aware of the problem. He's going to receive a black and white flag. And as he comes now down the pit road, then Alex Martin can't take this as his mandatory pit stop because he hasn't done enough of the regulation drive time. So he's hemorrhaging places and will have to pit again. The car comes down the pit lane. Where that puncture actually happened, we don't fully know. 
But what you can at least say in Alex Martin's favour is if it happened late in the lap, he was fortunate, and he's done a good job of not adding to the amount of damage around that front left corner because some people come back as quick as they can. Bodywork flies, rubber flails, damage is done, and that car is going to drop in GT3 behind Ian Loggy, so it's going to be sixth in the category. As we see Sasha Kaked stop through Starkey's just before McLean's, that looks like it's properly just off the track is he's had a spun moment off. Yeah, yeah wow look at the witness marks yeah that would have been very similar to mike price's one we saw earlier he's and taken the corner marker with him as well that's the white polystyrene bollard destroyed you can see on the side of the road now if this car fires up he's good to go if it won't and it needs retrieval from an external force it might need a safety car intervention this is not the time of the race for the collards that they wanted a safety car if they wanted one at all uh, we are about Six minutes or so away from there, uh, sorry, eight minutes away from a GT3 pit stop. We are about four minutes away from a GT4 pit stop. It's a long way off the road, in fairness. And he's away and moving, so Sasha Kakad absolutely spot off there, Joe. Well done. Um, he's got it moving again, so the road is clear. There's a little bit of damage maybe on the front, uh, possibly after glancing off that uh, corner ball. Up. But the net result is the road is clear. It's uh, a big sigh of relief in race control, and probably at Barwell, or at least half the Barwell garage, not the Sandy Mitchell half. So in the traffic, there are battles going on. Rob Collard has got another couple of laps, maybe, before he gives way to Ricky. And that is Mark Smith, who has spun right in front of the leader. Coming out of the last corner, cars scatter each way. If you're committed to the pit lane, you're OK, in a sense, because you're going slower and you've got a tighter line. If you're absolutely on it in a GT3 car, the road becomes very narrow, and Mark Smith is trying to turn the car around, but he's against the flow of the traffic. He's done it. He's got the car back in the right direction. And away he goes, lights up the rear tyres. There is a much mopping of brow all round. If you're staying on track, what does he do? He gets hit by Tilbrook, doesn't he? Turned around, look at the brake dust pouring yeah. out as it goes sideways. He did a mega, mega job there to get that car round in a safe, relatively safe and uh, efficient yeah. manner. <laughs> Three more cars and our race leader boxes. Indeed, so now the GT3 drivers are coming in, including Rob Collard, race leader, driven a great stint, you've got to say. So down the pit road he comes. Young Ricky will take over from his dad and 78 then Alex Martin uh, still in the middle sector so this actually gets around the stacking problem to a degree because number seven they would like to get rid of that has been a place change there look number 90 uh, has moved ahead of number seven 44 uh, seconds to be served by number 90 McLaren 39 to the Aston so it was either a slow stop for number seven Aston Martin or uh, the pit stop time wasn't done correctly for number 90 McLaren. As we see the seven car in the gravel trap, is that on the exit of Redgate, just yeah. getting the car back in over Hollywood? Was that a, a mechanical issue or a driver issue? Obviously that car led so much earlier on, fell off at the end of that first stint, can't see any obvious damage. A bit of an odd one there, because if you do break a bit late as a driver, you've actually got the track width still to play with to stop going in the gravel. So can't see any damage where he would have been left to sort of be pushed wide so uh, uh, we need another look at that before I work out who to blame. And here he is in second place that car uh, didn't look all that sparkling in qualifying it was seventh on the grid yeah okay it's had uh, help with one or two people having troubles early on in the race but Johnny Adam has been chipping away last time around the gap was hovering around the nine second mark 9.7 it's gone up a bit this time to 10 but you've just seen him have to get through traffic uh, but certainly he is a lot lot closer to the Collards in this second stint than Giacomo Petrobelli was in the first stint. This, finally, as you can see, is the fight for fifth place. Finally, in as much as Sandy Mitchell has got himself ahead of Maxi Gertz and straight away onto the tail of Phil Key. Porsche versus Lamborghini, and even if Sandy Mitchell can't win the race, he needs every place he can get because he needs every point he can get for the championship. Phil Keane having to defend. Yes, he was overtaking the Ginetta, but the collar, the run side from Mitchell was so strong round the outside. Surely not. Gets it stopped. Phil Keane on the apex. Great camera view there. Phil's just going to lean on him a little bit, but this is job done for Mitchell. He now has the inside into the last corner. Brilliant move. Barwell Lamborghini goes up into fifth place. Barwell Motorsport heading for the team's championship if things stay as they are now. And up towards the timing line comes Sandy Mitchell then with that great move. And you can see all the debris on the road at the S's. It's not just that the cars look doggy, it, it is that the road is just like a big litter bin. There, number seven look is the Mikey Day Aston whacking the tar stack, and that then dislodges it. And more bits of car fly. That was the 61 Mustang with the inner of the wheel arch flying into the 
face virtually of Sandy Mitchell, who dodges around it. But just, just look in the bottom left and how dirty the racetrack is. There are still bits flying and now a big chunk of debris in the middle of the road. Yeah, and the, the tyre stack moved, I think, yeah. like 30 centimetres when that number seven Aston hit it. So all these drivers, suddenly the next lap, the tyre stack's even closer, yeah. more likely to hit it because you just got into your rhythm as a driver. You've got your brake point, your turning point, your throttle point, and then suddenly the rules have just been changed because the tyre stack has moved. And we are under full course yellow, as Bryn was saying. We have uh, 56 Janessa that has stopped on the Grand Prix loop, and that needs retrieval. Uh, there is Freddie Tomlinson, who's out of the car. He's OK, but the car, by the uh, look of it, is at the bottom of the loop where the barrier is. Now, of course, one of the dramas of the Grand Prix loop is the heavy braking zones, and we're, we're late into the race. Yeah, and I've said it a couple of times, so sorry if I'm boring you, but that Janetta was working no his brakes. No. Thank you, I appreciate it very much. It means a lot coming from you. Um, but those brakes were getting so hot, we could see them glowing in the daylight, and I just wonder if that is almost, a, not a brake failure, but the brakes get so hot, it boils the fluid. Let's have a look. So we're going to see it pitch down. Does look, but look, at, I think the brake disc may be exploded. Mm. Did you see yeah. from the driver's front right, it suddenly just opened up with a load of dust yes there's dust normally but that was like a, a component failure there so, wow look at the the damage here the tire wall has done a mega job at dissipating that energy you can see the bonnet of the Janetta in the background circuit staff inspecting it my, my hope they can do there is get the tires bailed back up and just fire a few bolts through the conveyor belt to kind of build it up yes it needs to be safe but I think they can do a pretty good fast job hopefully in less than 17 minutes well, the safety car in this lap right I still think it's going to be pretty much one racing lap, given the time it's going to take Lorna Vickers to get around on the start and finish line, but we'll check. Safety car in this time. Now, this is the game. This is what we said was going to happen. The safety car lights are off, so Collard is in control. He's going to go as slow as he can to make that GT4 car hold up the teammate of Petrobelli. He shouldn't be going under 40 kilometers an hour, which is the minimum speed stipulated, but he is very close to that. But the slower he goes, the less chance of another lap within the two hours. He wants to time this so that when he comes across the line, and Barwell will be on the radio, no doubt, saying, right, OK, now you can accelerate. When there is less than a flying lap time left in the race, they'll get him to push. And Ricky Collard is starting to edge away just a little as he pulls the pin now down to the Melbourne hairpin. I think he's really close to getting two laps in here. If he crosses with anything more than 1 minute 29, 1 minute 30 to go, it will be two laps. Collard <laughs> crossing both <laughs> sets of fingers there. In 1 minute 38. Adam can't overtake this Lotus exactly. yet. I think he's done a perfect job, yeah. but it is going to be two laps. It's a brilliant restart by Ricky Collard because that pesky Lotus in GT4 pace, Johnny Adam could only overtake it now. He lined the car up beautifully, but he's 3.7 seconds back, and that is a lot to ask. We've got a minute and 20 seconds on the clock then, and Ricky Collard is away and gone. It looks as though it is going to be a second win of the season for the Collards, but Johnny Adam is going to drive this last lap slash two laps absolutely like qualifying laps yeah i think it's the latter i think it is two laps let's work on that theory for now as we come around the old hairpin he's done a really good job it's hard that lotus wouldn't have wanted to ruin the race but effectively has but it has given small he's still got a chance here hasn't he on the back of neary plowman is a lap down so you have to discount that black and pink paddock gt3 oh. and neary is off deep in there was that helped by um, by smallie sorry or was that tire temp not being where he needed it one would fear tire temp wouldn't you because as they came across the line it was tense between them so car in the gravel and we've got half a minute of the race to go down towards the s's comes ricky collard and after the great effort of the nearies yet again it uh, comes to nothing uh, possibly tire temp or brake temp or it might have been a puncture because of course tire pressures would have dropped there might have been a bit of debris on the road but this at the moment is the key story ricky collard trying to hang on for a race win the clock has 15 seconds on it he comes up towards Goddard he could back it off and make sure he doesn't do another lap he won't be caught by Johnny Adam what does he do as he comes out of the last corner six seconds on the clock five four three two he crosses the line with one second to spare he's got to do another lap but he's got four seconds in hand he stretched the margin this is the answer to the Mercedes and there's a little bit of smoke and a wobble and a, yeah it's a tire Front left's gone. Yeah, exactly that. You've called it completely right. And driver, obviously, Sam didn't get any warning there. That so, Ricky Collard then, he's been a race winner in GT World Challenge Europe. He has been a race winner in British GT. He's been a touring car racer. He's been a 
front runner and a race winner in Formula 4 and GB3. He's about to have a second British GT win of the season for Barwell Motorsport, for Lamborghini, for Rob and Ricky Collard. It's going to be a win at Donington. Checkered flag at the ready. The Collards win again. Over the line goes the Lamborghini. Second, Johnny Adam and Giacomo Petrobelli. Only just because right with them, Adam Smalley and Sean Balfe for fourth place in the end because they gain one more spot thanks to the Neeries and therefore narrowing the championship deficit. Uh, Sandy Mitchell and Alex Martin say so they were sixth. They're up to fourth in the end. So things have improved a little bit and the championship situation continues to be fascinating. Fifth over the line, Phil Keane. Sixth, Lewis Plato. And this is going to be your GT4 winner. Great effort by Charlie Robertson, but a real hat tip to Ravi Ramyid for a great first in. Yeah, I think both winners in class are down to the am. Rob Collard in GT3, Rami Ramyid in GT4. They have done a mega job and they were the difference today, which has let them win that. Ricky and Rob Collard are your winners at Donington Park in the penultimate round of the British GT Championship. They're chased home by Giacomo Petrobelli and Johnny Adam. The podium rounded out by Sean Balfe and Adam Smalley. Fourth, Sandy Mitchell and Alex Martin after an early puncture. Ian Loggy and Phil Keane's Porsche debut nets fifth. And Carl Cavers and Lewis Plato had a really good, solid run sixth ahead of Andrew Howard and Jessica Hawkins. Mark Smith after a spin and a trip through the gravel. Eighth with Martin Plowman's help. Matt Topham and Josh Rowledge ninth. And Callum McLeod and Mike Price after a troubled race in 10th. 13th after losing two laps early on, Maxi Gutz and Kevin Say. The near is classified 11th on distance, ahead of Sasha Kakad and Hugo Cook, who were off the road early on in the race too. 14th then, the GT4 winners, Charlie Robertson and Ravi Ramid, ahead of Seb Morris and Charles Dawson. And third in GT4, and winning their class, the silver-silver part of it, Jack Brown and Zach Meekin.